Okay, we've been talking about neurosis. Let's now talk about psychosis. Let's start once more on page 81. Notice in this paragraph that begins, I propose putting the problem the following terms. Notice how Lacan articulates the situation here. I propose putting the problem in the following terms. Prior to all symbolization, this priority is not temporal but logical for reasons that I think you now understand. There is, as the psychoses demonstrate, a stage at which it is possible for a portion of symbolization not to take place. That portion of symbolization that does not take place in the case of the psychotic is the bayahum, the primitive affirmation that the symbolic order exists, and a more or less acceptance of this bigger, broader, englobing world of the symbolic. The neurotic, the typical person, accepts this. That's the portion of symbolization that takes place for the neurotic. They accept that there is this preceding, bigger world of society that is commanding them to find a place in its order. In the case of the psychotic, this portion of symbolization, this affirmation of the symbolic itself at the level of the Bayahu does not take place. This initial stage precedes the entire neurotic dialectic. This Bayahu, this primitive affirmation of the symbolic order itself, precedes the entire neurotic dialectic, which is due to the fact that neuro neurosis is articulated speech. Interesting. By the sheer fact that the neurotic tends to be a talker, we have some evidence that this primitive affirmation of the symbolic, this full embrace of language with all of its rules and norms and codes of conduct is present. Insofar as the repressed and the return of the pressed, return of the pressed are one and the same thing. Why are they one and the same thing? Because you can't have one without the other. You don't learn about repression until you see a return of the repressed. The return of the repressed symbolizes the repressed, and the repressed symbolizes some primordial event, some primal scene that disturbed you enough to cause a symbol of it to be repressed in the first place. So that's one way to think about this. It's a series of signifiers. So what is repressed is not the scene of trauma in its entirety, but a symbol of it. It can be the smell that you remember of burning rubber at the scene of the crime when the car accident took place. And anytime you smell burning rubber, you seem exceptionally disgusted. Nobody likes that smell, but you hate it. The signifier that is repressed here is the smell of burnt rubber. And anytime you smell burnt rubber, you vomit. I don't know, you feel disgusted. You get angry. I don't know what the case may be. That's a return of the repressed. The burnt rubber that you smell today is symbolic of the burnt rubber that you smelled back then, which is symbolic of the car accident that you experienced as very traumatic back then. You see what I'm saying? So you have a system of signifiers at work here, is Lacan's point. The repressed is a symbol of the event that was traumatic, and the return of the repressed is a symbol of that repressed symbol. That's the way to read this stuff. It can thus happen that something primordial regarding the subject's being does not enter into symbolization and is not repressed, but is instead rejected, foreclosed. This is the primitive mechanism for psychosis. The neurotic is somebody who accepts the symbolic order, may not agree with its placement in the symbolic order, but accepts that it is there, recognizes that if it's going to get what it wants to its minimum disadvantage, it has to manipulate the symbolic. It has to use language, a system not of its own creation. It has to embrace a castrated, alienated existence in order to get its needs met. The psychotic 
does not experience this original acceptance, even if only to later reject the symbolic order. Let's keep going here. We're on page 81, this great introductory paragraph that further confirms what Lacan is up to here, which is to separate neurosis from psychosis. Blast forward a little bit with me to page 87. The top paragraph that begins, it looks very much as if psychosis has no prehistory. However, it so happens that when in exceptional circumstances that will have to be spelled out, something that has not been primitively symbolized appears in the external world, the subject finds himself absolutely unequipped, incapable of making Verneinung succeed in respect to this event, negation in other words. What then occurs has the characteristic of being totally excluded from the symbolizing compromise of neurosis. That's a really good expression here. The symbolizing compromise of neurosis. The neurotic or typical person has made a compromise. They're compromising their impulse to remain a crying, screaming, I want what I want when I want it, baby. They've compromised and said, I'm going to try and use language to get those needs met. It's a symbolizing compromise, which is to be read here as a compromise with and within the symbolic. And this is typical of neurosis. When then, what then occurs as the characteristic of being totally excluded from the symbolizing compromise of neurosis and through a veritable chain reaction at the level of the imaginary is translated into another register, that is, into the opposite diagonal of our little magic square. The little magic square, I believe, refers to schema L, but we don't need to mess with it right now. We're talking about how the psychotic operates here. Instead of experiencing language in the world of meaning at the level of the symbolic, as in the case of neurosis, the psychotic experiences language and meaning at the level of the imaginary. That's interesting. Both worlds intersect with the real. The symbolic and the real overlap, and so do the imaginary and the real. The symbolic real intersection will be one occupied by the neurotic. The imaginary real intersection, as we'll see, will be one occupied by the psychotic. A few lines down, four from where we just left, there's a phrase that comes up that I have to call your attention to. Lacan is talking about the psychotic and what they do. And notice what he says. The psychotic substitutes for symbolic mediation a profusion and imaginary proliferation. The neurotic person, the normal person, accepts a symbolic mediation. In other words, they accept that their needs, their impulses, their wants have to be mediated through language, have to be put into words. They have to come to terms with their impulses. That is a symbolic mediation, mediation through the field of language. Not so with the psychotic. They don't experience symbolic mediation. They experience imaginary proliferation a profusion of images instead, also known as hallucinations, visual, auditory, and otherwise. Let's keep going and see what else we can learn about this. Page 88, the end of our reading assignment for now, but also the beginning of our discussion of psychosis. Five lines down. What has emerged in the real, which for the subject represents something of himself that, is never, that he has never symbolized. So there's an imaginary proliferation, hallucinations, but the psychotic experiences these as expressions of the real. That's what we're gonna try and figure out next. This imaginary real slippage that goes on for the psychotic.